Greetings. My name is Sabrina Wirth and I am the Skirball's Membership Manager. The program you are about to hear was filmed by our wonderful videographer Hal Banfield and his crew for Member Preview Day for our Fall Exhibitions. This slide of ours, Activist Photographers of the Civil Rights Movement, the American Library by Yinka Shonabare, C-B-E-R-A, and Reclaimed, a Family Painting. I would like to extend gratitude to our valued members and donors who make it possible for the Skirball to offer meaningful and engaging exhibitions and programs. Membership sustains the Skirball's commitment to upholding timeless Jewish values, allowing us to present programs which celebrate discovery and hope, foster human connections, and call upon us to help build a more just society. In the program you are about to enjoy, you will hear from the curators of the Skirball's Fall Exhibitions, Alyssa Shapiro and Vicki Fung-Smith. First, you will hear from Skirball's Rabbi-in-Residence, Beaumont Shapiro, and Vice President and Museum Director, Sherry Bernstein. Sherry Bernstein is the Skirball's Cultural Center's Vice President and Museum Director. For two decades, she has played a key role in building the Skirball's identity as a vibrant, ambitious, and values-driven institution, first overseeing the Education and Visitor Experience Departments and, since 2021, the Museum. Bernstein led the creative team for the internationally acclaimed children's destination, Noah's Ark at the Skirball. Prior to the Skirball, she held positions at LACMA, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the ICA Boston. She has undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees in art history from Yale and Harvard universities, respectively. Rabbi Shapiro joined the Skirball in June as our rabbi in residence. Though new to the Skirball, he has long been a vital part of the Los Angeles Jewish community. Most recently, he served as a member of the clergy at Wilshire Boulevard Temple for more than a decade. He currently sits on the board of the Interreligious Council of Southern California, the Professional Development Committee of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and the Board of Nechama Jewish Response to Disaster. Rabbi Shapiro is a gifted teacher of music, Judaica, and Hebrew, and served as a Judaic educator and student rabbi at several summer camps. A California native who grew up in Santa Barbara, Rabbi Shapiro holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Southern California and a master's degree in Hebrew letters from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, where he was ordained in 2011. He is an avid golfer whose office is adorned with vintage golf photography and memorabilia. He and his wife, Ashley, have three young children. In everything he does, Rabbi Shapiro strives to bring people together to engage in meaningful work and experience the pride and warmth of Jewish community. We are fortunate and delighted to have him join our Skirball community. Enjoy the program. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so, so wonderful to be here. Uh, wonderful to see all of you. Uh, beautiful, beautiful way to start our Friday together. Um, and I was, I was thinking earlier this morning, uh, after having read um, the three newspapers, print newspapers, I'll add, that I, that I get every morning, probably the youngest person on the planet to get print newspapers still delivered. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and the headlines are just depressing. Just depressing. And, and CNN's no better, right? War in the Middle East, dysfunction, utter dysfunction in Washington, war in Ukraine, poverty, mass shootings, hunger. It's enough to make any of us, even the most optimistic and, and most positive, feel like uh, the world is maybe falling apart a little bit. Now, most or certainly many, many cultures, civilizations, uh, religions, traditions, 
orient themselves around some event or some person far in the past. Uh, an empire that once thrived, right? A king that once lived. Uh, Jesus, born, died. Muhammad, some event, some person, something in the distant past. Uh, the Jewish tradition is, is, is different in that while the past matters, it's actually oriented around the future, around a future event, around, the, around a world to come. And it's that kind of framework and that way of seeing things, this, this notion of having faith in the future, of having hope for a better and a brighter future, um, that I think probably has a lot to teach us this morning. Um, and in a way, I, I can't help but think that, that that's a theme that in, in some ways large and small is, is evoked in all three of our current exhibitions, this idea that um, we can use our past, we can look to our past, and it can actually give us hope and faith for the future. Uh, for better or worse, Judaism takes the long view. Right? And, and if we do that, um, it has felt like the world is coming apart before, and yet here we are. Right? And so we can, we can use the history that we know to give us that faith in the future and to give us that hope in the future. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to conclude with a, a story, one of my favorite stories, um, which is told by, by Rabbi Hugo Grin of Blessed Memory. And the story is about when he was a teenager with his father. Uh, and they were living in a concentration camp in Germany. And it was the winter of 1944. And they found themselves um, in the winter months. And Hugo's father said to him that it was the, the evening of the festival of Hanukkah, the evening of the first night of the festival of Hanukkah. And, and his father took out a small clay earthen bowl um, that they had made. And then he, he lit a wick and he put it in their incredibly precious ration of butter that had then by that point melted in this, in this bowl. And before he could recite the blessing over this, this Hanukkah candle, Hugo looked at his father and he says, Dad, we, we can't afford to, to, to burn this butter. We need every single calorie we can, we can eat. We need every single bit of food we possibly have. And his father looked at him and said, you know, son, we've seen and learned that we can live up to three weeks without food. And we can live up to three days without water but I cannot and will not live, not even for three minutes, without hope. Hope, I think, is what is essential, really, uh, for our survival. And hope is what is essential for our future. Um, and that is what I think our past comes to teach us, and what I think art in general comes to teach us, and particularly with these uh, three exhibitions uh, have to teach us in this, in this moment that we all find ourselves. Uh, so to a better and brighter and more hopeful future. Thank you. So good to see all of you. I'm Sherry Bernstein, as Sabrina said, the museum director, and it's wonderful to be with you, old and new faces, uh, to see all of you in the audience today. Um, I want to spend a few minutes just talking with you about the connection between our three new wonderful exhibitions and the Skirball's mission and really why we're here, why we exist. Uh, each of these shows highlights really a particular idea or topic that we return to again and again at the Skirball, intentionally so. 
Um, we are always looking to explore these kind of core ideas in fresh ways, often using the power and the creativity of artists to do so. In the case of this light of ours, activist photographers of the civil rights movement, that topic is of course civil rights and the ongoing pursuit of equality and um, justice under the law for all Americans. As members of a minority group that has faced discrimination uh, through and, and hatred at times throughout its history, even now as evidenced by the tragic events of recent weeks, uh, Jews have often found kinship with others who've struggled for equal treatment and unequal justice um, and opportunity. They've also often understood, as, as we assert emphatically at the Skirball, that all of our fates as, as Americans and as human beings are inextricably intertwined. Um, and also that, that positive enduring change is best achieved by working together as diverse coalitions. And those ideas are encapsulated so beautifully by um, our exhibition, This Light of Ours, um, which was organized by an institution in Utah, as our curator Alyssa will tell you, um, augmented by uh, an institution, the Maltz Museum uh, in uh, Ohio, and we and have added significantly to these shows as well for their presentation in Los Angeles. The American Library by Yinka Shonabare, uh, an installation um, by a British Nigerian artist that's on loan from the Rennie Collection in Vancouver, speaks directly to another really important um, topic for us, that of immigration. We are delighted to be the first uh, institution in Los Angeles to present this incredible work, which Vicki and I um, have each gone up to see at, at Stanford, where it was previously. Um, and the, the exhibition explores the stories, contributions, uh, varying perspectives, and resonant journeys of thousands of people who've traveled to this country from its inception to the present day, as well as um, the many generations of people who've been impacted by the Great Migration. The experience of transit um, and displacement, of, of arriving in a new place and really seeking a sense of belonging, is not only endemic to Jewish history and the Jewish experience, but also is, of course, so um, resonant in our own city of Los Angeles. Now, finally, our, our new exhibition, Reclaimed, a family painting, speaks to the quintessential skirball topic of family and its power to shape, to galvanize, and to uplift us. A painting by a biblical father and son that you'll hear more about, um, Isaac and Jacob, by a German Baroque artist named Johann Karl Loth, um, serves as the cornerstone of this original Skirball Spotlight exhibition. And it is a piece that is on loan to us uh, for 20 years, and we're just so honored to be the stewards of this story that you'll learn about. Um, Reclaimed tells the story of one Jewish family whose life in Europe was ravaged by the Nazis, their journey um, from Brno, Czechoslovakia, all the way to Los Angeles, and their unflagging 80-year quest for restitution. Now there's one final um, topic that I wanna mention today that infuses all three of our new exhibitions and really is at the core of um, what we stand for, and it is, I would say, just a fundamental Jewish concept that uh, reverberates in many other cultures. And it is that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Um, I think always of my, my grandma Gloria, who used to repeat this um, Jewish phrase, which many of you uh, may know, Lador Vador. And that is kind of a, a unifying theme that um, connects our exhibitions from generation to generation is what that means in, in English. So right now I'm really circling back to some of what um, Rabbi Shapiro was talking about when we're, when we're thinking about why we're presenting this trio of exhibitions. So when we talk about the importance of, in Jewish culture of honoring memory, of delving into history, uh, as all three of our, of our exhibitions do in different ways, it is not simply to preserve the past. Um, it is also really to mine the past, to learn from the experiences and the ideals of the courageous, very human um, 
people who preceded us. And um, whether they were immigrants and migrants who uh, you know, shaped this country, often in the face of prejudice and adversity, um, or black Americans and a diverse coalition of supporters who together fueled the civil rights movement, uh, or three generations of women in a single family who sought restitution and a sense of wholeness in the, the face of the, the, the Holocaust. The purpose of looking back from a Jewish perspective and from the Skirball's perspective, uh, as Rabbi Bo so eloquently said, is that so we can move forward um, and we can take action today with renewed strength, with renewed humanity, and renewed hope. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our first curator who's gonna to speak to you. And I wanna say that we are so fortunate to have brought on two new um, curators this year, both of whom you'll hear from. Um, so they have become just a, an essential part of our, our community and you'll see why. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Vicki Fung-Smith, who joined the Skirball as associate curator in the spring of 2023. She is the curator of the American Library by Yinka Shonabare and an upcoming exhibition that you'll hear about at a future date, um, opening in January 2024 called Common Ground. Prior to the Skirball, Smith was a gallerist and curator of contemporary art for over 15 years at a number of important Los Angeles uh, art spaces, including the Frank Lloyd Gal uh, Gallery, Acme Gallery, and Bridge Projects, which is where I had the pleasure of first meeting her. Uh, and that's where she curated, among other exhibitions, a show exploring the Jewish holiday of Sukkot in, through a contemporary lens. A Los Angeles native born to Vietnamese immigrants, Smith is passionate about art that is centered around a sense of community, education, and storytelling. She received her BFA from the University of Dallas in Irving, Texas. So um, join me in welcoming Vicki to the podium. Thank you, Sherry. Um, change the slide. You're probably fixing it. Oh, sorry. The American Library by artist Yinka Shonabari explores topics of immigration, identity, and belonging through an immersive library setting where shelves are filled with more than 6,000 books individually wrapped in colorful Dutch Oops. fabrics <laughs> featuring the names of U.S. immigrants and black Americans who have made notable contributions to American life and culture. Shonabari's installation celebrates the diversity of the American population while inviting audiences to reflect upon what it means to be American. While the answers to this question are as varied as the people that make up the country, Shonabari offers that America is a place of immigrants where identities, cultures, and histories are not fixed nor easily defined. And through a library setting, this installation inspires us to remain engaged in learning and understanding. The Skirball Cultural Center is proud to present the American Library as part of its enduring commitment to welcoming the stranger and fostering a plural and more just society. The American Library sp spotlights people and not ideology. Every person's story counts and has a spot in the library. The 6,000 books in this installation feature first and second generation immigrants and black Americans affected by the Great Migration, one of the largest movements of people in US history during the period of 1916 to 70, when approximately 6 million black people fled the American South to escape seg segregation. In contrast, the names of people who have spoken out against immigration equality and diversity are also included. A further set of books without names printed on the spine speak to the ongoing nature of this debate and invite interpretation. They could represent stories yet to be told or stories that are lost or an opportunity for visitors to imagine their own names in the library. This installation shows the complexity of the ongoing debates around immigration and nationalism, presenting not just one point of view, but many perspectives. The Skirball's exhibition is unique from past installations of the American Library because it also includes 
an animated video designed for children, a display of Dutch wax fabrics to touch, and additional interactive components to promote engagement and conversation. There are iPads installed in the exhibition that connects to the artists, the American Library website, where visitors can learn more about the people named in the library through an, a searchable online directory. The artist also includes a section for visitors to submit their own immigration story to the website. Expanding on the story sharing invitation from the artist, visitors can add their names and share their, their stories to an interactive bookshelf display that mimics the art installation. Visitors can respond to a set of questions that will be available on a nearby table and then add them to the, to the display. Questions like, what brought you to Los Angeles? How could America be a more welcoming place? What part of your culture would you share with others? Visitors will have the opportunity to contribute to the conversation and be a part of the Skirball's nearly year-long exhibition. In considering the Skirball community and our younger visitors, we also included a short animated film about the artist and a display for guests to touch the same fabrics that the artist uses in the installation. Uh -oh. there we go. The American Library was first commissioned for the Front International Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art, a free public art exhibition that takes place across Cleveland, Akron, and Oberlin every th three years. For this multi-city multi wide exhibition in 2018, the American Library was actually installed in a real library. It was the Cleveland Public Library. Shonabari Studio collaborated with the Cleveland Public Library staff in researching and compiling all the names included. This library series is part of an ongoing series by Shonabari that explores patterns of migration, colonization, and cultural exchange. The artist first started his library series in response to growing anti-immigration discourse and xenophobia. The British Library is the first work in the series and is intended to provoke discussion, debate, and reflection on all aspects of British culture, considering notions of, of territory, place, cultural identity, displacement, and refuge. The African Library's focus is a little bit different in that it commemor commemorates Africans in the fight for independence in the European colonies across the African continent and celebrates the achievements by Africans since liberation. And finally, why does the artist use these colorful fabrics in many of his artworks, including the library? The fabrics are called Dutch wax fabrics, a material with mixed origins that mirrors the multicultural identity embedded in the history of the United States. To quote the artist, I grew up imagining that these textiles were authentically African, then to find out that actually the fa fabrics are Indonesian influence produced by the Dutch, who then tried to sell those fabrics in Indonesia but the industrially produced fabrics were not acceptable there, so the Dutch tried West Africa. Now the fabrics are being made in Africa and in China, but I thought this was very interesting because I thought of this fabric as the ideal metaphor for this kind of global contemporary citizen. Lastly, I'd like to give you a brief biography on the artist. Yinka Shonabari is an internationally acclaimed artist who lives and works in the UK. He was born in London in 1962 to Nigerian parents, and he moved back to Lagos, Nigeria at the age of three with his family. He returned to the UK to study fine art and received his MFA. Shonabari's work examines race, class, and the construction of cultural identity. The artist works in many different mediums, including painting, sculpture, photography, film, and installation. Shonabari uses the honorific CBE and RA as part of his name. The CBE stands for Commander of the Order of the British Empire, and the RA stands for Royal Academician, which is he's part of the Royal Academy, which is like the longest, the oldest established art school in London. He uses these honorifics ironically in response to his attitudes towards the British Empire and its legacies of colonialism. And then to quote the artist, coming from a mixed background and not wanting to define myself by one nationality, there are these binaries, Nigerian or British, and people seem quick to try and define things. 
there seems to be a tendency to try and make people choose to come down one side of these binaries. My work addresses the idea of having this fusion or hybrid cultural identity and what that produces. People always want to categorize things. I'm much more interested in this idea of a hybrid. As I work for myself, I don't have to answer to anyone. I can operate with this agency and not have to make these decisions." End quote. So, and as the world becomes more and more multicultural and diverse, I think it's very important that arts and culture also reflects this diversity, which is why I'm so honored to be presenting this exhibition to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Alyssa Shapiro. Alyssa joined the Skirball team in February of this year. That is just hard to believe that you're both that new that you've accomplished a lot already. Um, and she is our associate curator and collections specialist. She's the managing curator of This Light of Ours, um, that exhibition, activist photographers of the civil rights movement, and the curator of Reclaimed, a family painting. Prior to the Skirball, where I just want to share a little fun fact with you, uh, many years ago, she was our summer intern in the education department. Um, Alyssa curated uh, exhibitions for museums um, uh, around the country, including the Art Institute of Chicago and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She holds a BA in art history from Harvard, an MA in curatorial studies from the Courtauld uh, in London, and she will soon graduate with a PhD in art history from Northwestern, where her research focused on US art, culture, and photojournalism during the Holocaust. So it's my pleasure to um, bring to the podium Alyssa Shapiro. Good afternoon and Shabbat Shalom. So first, I'm going to talk about the exhibition Reclaimed, a family painting. Reclaimed tells the story of Nazi looted art through the experiences of one Jewish Czech family who spent over 80 years fighting to reclaim the most important object in their family's art collection. 17th century Baroque painting, Isaac Blessing Jacob, which tells a biblical story from the Old Testament and was painted by German artist Johann Karl Loth. Reclaimed addresses themes and histories that are central to the skirball, including immigration, survival, resilience, and the power of art and culture to bring people together. The exhibition developed after our Holocaust art restitution lawyer contacted the Skirball in 2020 to offer Isaac Blessing Jacob on long-term loan to the museum for 20 years on behalf of her LA-based clients. Former associate curator and registrar, registrar Danny Killam advocated for the museum to accept the loan and to craft an exhibition around the painting and the family that worked so hard to bring it home. With the precipitous rise in anti-Semitism here in the US and around the world, it is more important than ever to remember and to teach the lessons of the Holocaust as Jews once again fight for our safety and our survival. In this exhibition, we tell the family's story chronologically, starting with Johann and Lisbeth Bloch. In the decades leading up to World War II, from 1939 to 1945, Johann and Lisbeth Bloch lived in Bruno, Czechoslovakia, surrounded by precious art, antiques, and beloved family heirlooms. Johann and Lisbeth were a sophisticated couple with cosmopolitan taste, as seen in their professional photographs and the objects in their collection. Johann ran E. Bloch and Sons, his family's successful leather goods and processing factory that gained success as the company that provided the leather saddles for the cavalry. And Lisbeth herself was a renowned art collector, 
mostly noted for her, her collection of Czech glass, which you see in this photograph. In 1922, the Blocks together purchased Isaac Blessing Jacob from a gallery in Vienna, which they proudly displayed in their dining room, the most important place for the family where they gathered for their meals. The Blocks' lives changed drastically as the Nazis came to power in Czechoslovakia beginning in 1938. Johann tried desperately to flee with his second wife, Erna, who was also Jewish. Lisbeth had passed away tragically in a car accident in 1928. At the same time, Johann also attempted to export his art collection out of the country. Though, unfortunately, both attempts were unsuccessful. In 1939, the Nazis confiscated Johann's home and art collection and sold Isaac Blessing Jacob at auction. In fact, at the same auction house, the Dorotheum in Vienna, where the couple had purchased the painting in 1922. In the gallery, the Herd Gallery, our smallest and most intimate space here at the Skirball, we evoke the family dining room based on a photograph of Johann's home taken in the 1930s, showing how it looked before the Nazis stole the painting off the family's walls. The following year, in 1940, Johann died in Prague of a heart condition under the conditions of occupation. His wife, Erna, and many of Johann's relatives, and you'll see photos of them and even a home video that includes some of these relatives, would later be murdered by the Nazis. Johann's daughter, Hetty, her Catholic husband, Leo, and their two-year-old daughter, Liz, fled Czechoslovakia right before the Nazis first annexed part of the country in 1938. Though before they left, Hetty and Liz were baptized as Catholic. For an interfaith couple like Hetty and Leo, conversion helped shield the family from anti-Jewish persecution and was one method for Jews trying to escape. Upon leaving Czechoslovakia, Hetty, Leo, and Liz first went to Switzerland and then to Ireland, where the antiques and furniture in the exhibition were shipped by Leo's Catholic mother, thereby saving them from Nazi looting. And those are the objects that you'll see in the exhibition. In June of 1940, the family moved to the US with almost nothing to their name. As a cherubic four-year-old, almost looking like Shirley Temple in the photograph here, Liz was photographed by New York newspapers, including the New York Daily News and the New York Times, following her arrival in the port in New York. And these images, including this one here, ended up being included in newspaper coverage of wartime flight from Europe to the US. Hetty, Leo, and Liz settled in Los Angeles in 1943 after moving around the country for Leo's job. Already struggling with money, Hetty's financial situation worsened when she divorced Leo shortly after the war's end. As a single mother, Hetty worked numerous jobs to support her family, including as a Los Angeles public school bus driver and an, and an electrical assembly technician, eventually becoming a quality control supervisor at Xerox. You see that photograph there of her on the production lines. She also created a line of handmade stuffed animals called Holifornia Creations, drawing upon her talent with a needle and thread learned back in Czechoslovakia from her family's live-in seamstress. Liz also quickly adapted to life in Los Angeles, attending local public schools, getting married, and having her own children, including a daughter named Cheryl. While building their lives in Los Angeles after the war, Hetty never lost sight of what the Nazis had stolen from the, their family. The lives of her beloved relatives, her childhood home, and her parents' treasured art collection. Later, aided by her daughter Liz, 
Hetty hired lawyers, traveled back to Europe, and wrote to government officials fighting for restitution and reclamation. As proof of her family's pre-war art ownership, Hetty included in many of the claims she filed the series of photographs taken inside her father's house in the 1930s by Czech Jewish architectural photographer, Dr. Bruno Wolf, himself a victim of the Holocaust. It was Hetty's wherewithal to bring these photographs with her as she fled Czechoslovakia that ensured the return of Isaac Blessing Jacob. However, that didn't happen for many years. In spite of her proof, this proof through photographs, no art objects were found, let alone returned, by the time of Hetty's death at age 91 in 1997. In the early 2000s, Liz's daughter Cheryl resumed her late grandmother's fight for reclamation, working closely with the Holocaust Claims Processing Office, a government organization that provides free aid to Holocaust victims and their families trying to recover stolen assets. In 2020, Isaac Blessing Jacob appeared again on the art market and once again at the Dorotheum Auction House in Vienna. The Holocaust Claims Processing Office successfully negotiated its return to the Bloch heirs and arranged the painting's long-term loan to the Skirball, presenting emails sent between Los Angeles, New York, London, and Vienna over a span of 20 years. An animated video at the conclusion of the exhibition highlights Cheryl's tireless efforts to track down and reclaim Isaac Blessing Jacob for her family, by harnessing the power of the internet. Beyond telling the story of the Bloch family, this exhibition also allowed us to shine a light on our own collection, particularly objects given by the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, a post-war Jewish agency tasked with redistributing Jewish objects stolen by the Nazis, which they gave to the Hebrew Union College Museum, the forerunner of the Skirball in the 1950s as these objects were deemed airless Jewish artifacts. We feature five such objects in the exhibition, as well as highlight four more JCR works in our core exhibition, Visions and Values. The Rothschild menorah, a tefillin case, a Max Liebermann painting, and our beloved Moritz Oppenheim's Sabbath afternoon. So I encourage you all to go into the core and read the new labels that we've written for these objects. And now to our other exhibition. This slide of ours, Activist Photographers of the Civil Rights Movement, comes to us from the Center for Documentary Expression and Art in Salt Lake City, Utah. The original curatorial team consisted of Matt Heron, one of the photographers in the exhibition, Charles E. Cobb Jr., a veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and a group of leading historians and civil rights experts who served as consultants. The Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage in Cleveland, Ohio, later organized the final section of the exhibition about voting rights activism today. This exhibition presents a unique record of the civil rights movement through the work of nine photographers from a variety of places and backgrounds. Identifying as black, white, Jewish, Christian, Native American, Mexican American, and even Japanese Canadian, this diverse group of photographers, the majority of whom were members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, captured on film an insider's perspective of the civil rights movement. In particular, they highlighted the inclusive coalition of activists and volunteers many from minority groups, including Jews, who work to support black Americans' leadership of the civil rights movement, and in doing so, produced a revolution in social justice. This history presents a model of allyship that we hope to emulate today, especially as we grapple with continued threats to and struggles for civil rights. For the Skirball's presentation of the exhibition, 
we added 15 historic objects and a new installation, highlighting local and national organizations at the forefront of contemporary voting rights activism. We also animated the galleries with music and the voices of photographers speaking about their images to evoke the spirit of the movement. The exhibition is divided into four historical sections. Section one, Black Life, What We Saw, shows the ways in which movement photographers documented a side of black life in the South often ignored by the media, a side that was based on their authentic investment in the communities and people they came to know while working alongside local black activists to advocate for change. The largest section of the exhibition, section two, Organizing for Freedom, focuses on SNCC's activism, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC's activism in Mississippi and Alabama related to voter registration efforts, fundraising and educational initiatives, large-scale marches, and political protests. Mississippi's Freedom Summer in 1964 and events in Selma and Montgomery, Alabama in 1965 provided the final impetus for the U.S. government to pass the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which outlawed discriminatory voting practices, a major victory for the movement. The installation photograph that you see here on your left includes photographs taken by Japanese Canadian photographer Tamiyo Wakayama, featuring black and white volunteers singing together before venturing south to Mississippi. SNCC employed freedom songs to garner strength during the most turbulent times of the 1960s. SNCC's songbooks and albums, which you see here in the exhibition, created often as part of fundraising campaigns, combined the art forms of photography and music in order to educate and inspire people across the country through shared song. All of the objects in this case are skirball additions to the exhibition and you'll also hear ambient music in the galleries, which is also unique to the skirball. This section also highlights the series of Alabama marches that drew notable participants, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. In addition to rabbis, lesser known young Jews like Jim Leather, seen here, pictured on crutches and wearing a yarmulke, also participated in these marches. And here we have Jim Leather crutching alongside Dr. King and John Lewis, the president of SNCC and others, all the way from Selma to Montgomery. Section three, state and local terror, assesses how civil rights workers, many of whom were minorities, risked their lives for the cause. They were routinely brutalized and sometimes killed by white supremacist vigilantes and local Southern authorities. Some murders were ignored by the media, while others, particularly those of non-black activists, drew attention to the cause, forcing governmental action. Created for the March on Washington, this poster, seen here, includes part of Jewish photographer Bob Edelman's image of young black activists attacked by fire hoses in Birmingham, Alabama, and holding hands to withstand the assault. The artist who made this poster, Louis Lomonaco, connects these protesters to Michelangelo's hand of God from the Sistine Chapel in this poster, which he created for participants on the March on Washington, thereby anointing them as they hold hands to stay standing. The Skirball actually acquired this poster for our permanent collection through the research that we undertook for this exhibition. Section four, Meredith March Against Fear and the Birth of Black Power, shows that despite the passage of the Voting Rights Act, civil rights leaders and participants realized that there was still more work to do to guarantee the ability to vote and equality more generally for black Americans. James Meredith's 1966 Mississippi March started to reveal a change within the movement 
as young black activists realized that the principles of nonviolence could only take them so far in producing real change in a society that was clearly still struggling with racism. And this joining of the movement and this sort of activism led to the establishment of the black power movement. The final section of the exhibition called Unfinished Business looks at voting rights in the US today, focusing on the 2013 Shelby County v. Holder Supreme Court decision that eliminated critical protections against discrimination promised by the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the central legislation that was passed because of the advocacy of civil rights workers. This exhibition, this final section in the exhibition also provides a call to action by highlighting LA-based and national organizations that are picking up the mantle from SNCC to protect the right to vote and to safeguard civil rights for all. As we prepare for the upcoming 2024 election, this work is more urgent than ever. We highlight, therefore, organizations that we hope will empower our visitors to get involved through membership in groups ranging from LA Free the Vote to the League of Women Voters to the Jewish Center for Justice, the NAACP, and Voto Latino. And in this installation that's unique to the Skirball, we tried to evoke the feel of a bulletin board on a college campus, really thinking and being inspired by the way that the students within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee use their resources at hand to really make a difference. And that's the sort of difference we hope this exhibition will make and we will all make today. Thank you. There we go. Are we all live? Thank you so much, Alyssa and Vicki. We want to spend just, and I'm sorry if I'm being blocked a little bit by this lectern. I'm going to pull back a little so I can see some of your faces over here. Um, we're going to spend just a few minutes uh, talking about, kind of diving into the exhibitions and getting the personal perspective, really, of Alyssa and Vicki, because at the Skirball, you know, the human piece is so important to us. Exhibitions and everything else that we do here is created by people. And so we want to make that connection for you. So I want to start um, just by asking each of you what uh, aspects of the exhibition or exhibitions that you worked on um, resonates with you kind of personally or professionally, if you kind of could speak to that. So maybe we'll start with Vicki. OK. Um, well, I, I was really like excited and honored to be curious, like that this is my first exhibition that I'm curating at the Skirball. And I think like the connection for me is like, I am also, I'm also a second generation immigrant. Um, so my, yeah, my parents uh, came here as uh, refugees during the Vietnam War. So there was like, a very deep resonant um, connection there. And I, when I was installing the show, it really made me think of like, I was looking at the names and like, I think this is something like, I think anyone can relate to, like whatever your background or your ethnicity is, is like whenever you see a name that you're like, that person is like for me, I'm like, that person's Vietnamese. And like, it's like, oh, it's a new person. I, I don't know who that is. And it's like, I think, you know, as whatever your background is, like if you're Greek, you know, if you're Filipino, you're like, you probably know every famous, person that's that that identifies that way you know like oh I know every every Greek actor or every Greek um, singer songwriter so I think for me like I when I was going through I found a name Eugene Trin and he's a Vietnam he's the first Vietnamese American astronaut um, and he was born in Saigon and then he was a payload specialist on the uh, space shuttle Columbia and that was like, it was something so beautiful because I was just thinking of, wow, when I was a kid, I wish I'd known that, you know, like just, I think being a kid and being an immigrant, you come and then you, you just can't imagine that you could do these things, you know? So I think that's what's really beautiful and resonant and personal. Um, 
I learned recently, like, I've all, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase imposter syndrome. And I never really, to be honest, I didn't totally understand <laughs> the meaning behind it until someone said something that when you feel underrepresented in your context. And it's this idea of that in whatever kind of space or environment you inhabit, if you're the only one that looks like you, you have this sense of that I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's what really connects me with the American Library is that this is a place where all walks of life, all backgrounds are represented and you can see yourself. And so that, yeah. that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I think about the, you'll see the, the, the way that American Library is uh, constructed, there almost are these kind of embracing arms and it's a kind of this welcoming hug in a way and the ability to kind of find yourself represented within that is, is really a part of it. Alyssa, tell us. Sure, so my academic trajectory and professional trajectory has always taken me in two kind of divergent directions. Um, I am both a Holocaust scholar something I've been doing for a long time, and thinking about art made during the, the Holocaust, art that circulated during the Holocaust, the experiences of primarily Jewish art collectors and gallerists and artists who fled to the US or tried to flee to the US during the Holocaust. So for me, that obviously speaks to reclaimed. I'm also the granddaughter of two very proudly Jewish American soldiers who fought the Nazis during World War II. My parents are here, both of their, both, hi, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> both of, both of their, their fathers. Um, and so the Holocaust has always been personal to me in that way. And also because particularly on my dad's side, um, we lost pretty much everyone who wasn't able to get out of Poland. Um, so from the personal perspective of the Holocaust and as a Holocaust scholar, Reclaimed is a story that resonated deeply with me. But the other path of my academic and professional life has thought about 20th century US photography. And before coming to the Skirball, I co-curated an exhibition that was most recently at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston on the photographs of Life magazine. And there was a section of that exhibition that looked at civil rights photography. And so when I joined the Skirball in February, Sherry, knowing my background and these, these two interests that often feel quite far apart, Sherry said to me, you wanna take on two shows that speak to everything that you love? And I said, yeah, bring it on. And she's still speaking to me. <laughs> and I still love Sherry. Um, so thinking about civil rights photography is something that has been part of my professional career for a long time and being able to tell a different story of the civil rights movement through photographs was, was a true privilege for me. Um, the perspective that I always had was from photojournalists, a photojournalist primarily from Life magazine. So seeing these insiders, these activist photographers who lived and worked within the movement really showed me this other side that I wasn't aware of. And I figured if I wasn't aware of it, most people who don't have that sort of context for it wouldn't be aware of it as well. And, and together these exhibitions work really well in the way that they think about justice. How do you fight for justice? How do you advocate for justice? Who are the people you encounter along the way who help you do this vital work of, of gaining a sense of wholeness, of honoring your, your family, your past, your legacy, and trying to make a better world going forward? Thank you. You know, the beauty of living in a, in a free society is that we give people the opportunity to make meaning themselves and find their own meaning. And that's certainly what we hope people will do within these exhibitions. That said, um, I think our curators, you know, when they're putting together an exhibition and working with the designer and, and working with specialists, they have in mind certain things that they hope people will get out of uh, the, the experience of going to an exhi their exhibition. So I wondered if you would each just speak a little bit about something that you hope that people will take away before we set this good group of people loose and to explore on their own. Alyssa, why don't we start with you? Sure. So we, 
oftentimes as curators, we have these hopes for what people will, will take away. And we actually materialized these hopes and made them real um, in both of the exhibitions that I worked on, which I'm really thrilled we were able to do. So in the final section of This Light of Ours, we have this, this new installation called Activism Today, where we have a QR code that anyone can scan and be linked to each of the organizations that we highlight that are really at the forefront of voting rights activism today. And so we don't just hope that people are inspired by the images that they see throughout these, this exhibition. And, and while some of them are deeply challenging to look at, there are many that really are inspiring, but inspiration only gets us so far. We want people to take action. And I know that I've taken action even in doing this work and becoming connected to organizations like the Jewish Center for Justice, where now I'm working very closely with the rabbi who runs it, and organizations like Register Her um, that is engaged in trying to ensure that primarily women of color are registered for the next election. Um, and so I, I hope that people take that call to action seriously. And we have it right there on the wall and we're asking our visitors to do so. And then for Reclaimed, at the end of the exhibition, we also have a QR code that we want people to scan. And we have listed restitution resources. I want people who are going through the exhibition who themselves are Holocaust survivors or who had families that survived or know of, of heirs of people who survived the Shoah to think, okay, maybe I can do this too. I can start the process of reclamation. I've seen firsthand what it has done for this family. I worked very closely with Cheryl and Liz on this exhibition, and Cheryl always says to me that the process of going through these, this years-long protracted battle to get back her family's belongings and then doing this history and research, she's never been closer with her mother, who's 87 years old, than she is today. And I had the great honor of taking them through the exhibition yesterday and seeing the mother and daughter crying and hugging each other is something that will stay with me for my life. And so I hope that other people feel empowered to start this process, which is not easy, but there are resources, there are individuals, and primarily free resources for families that also want to take the step of gaining a bit more of a sense of wholeness by getting back some of the things that their family members had once loved. That's beautiful, thank you. Now, Vicki, tell us what you uh, kind of envision and hope people might get out of uh, the American Library. Well, um, I think I said it earlier too, but I, I, like one, yes, definitely one thing is that, that I hope that visitors can walk away and the and see themselves and and realize that they are part of of what makes this country what it is and i think in that as well is that we're, we're a place of immigrants we all have our own our own stories whether it's our own whether it's our grandmothers where it's our great grandmothers we all have a story of where we came from and what we brought with us uh, to this place and um and then also to just to realize that it, it, we're a place of immigrants, we're also a, a place of pluralism. Since we're a place of immigrants, we've, we've all come from somewhere else. We have a, um, there's a plurality of voices and that sometimes some of the voices you wish were l like not as loud as others, <laughs> let's just say. Um, and even though the installation is, it's very much a pro-immigration um, installation, it, the artist also recognizes that there's a lot of people in this country that are, that are against immigration. And, and some of those people who are outspoken about this may be immigrants themselves, and that's, that's complex. But, that it's, but, but really to, to remain open um, and engaged in, in, in conversation, and I think we live in a time where we're just more and more so deeply polarized, and we, we, we tend to just um, to talk with people who share our, our views and our opinions. And I, I think even though this is such a beautiful installation and really promoting of like the best parts of our country, it's also an installation that recognizes 
the flaws, but but that you know to really practice that welcome and this idea of pluralism and this idea of freedom and democracy is that your neighbor might disagree with you and to kind of, but you can still hold their humanity and be and show kindness. So that's something Amen. I'd like to. Amen. Think about. Yes. You know, I think each of you, I'm listening to your answers, there's so much overlap in what you're saying in terms of, I, I'm just thinking of the fact that the books um, on the shelves in uh, the American Library include blank books, that history is still being written. And one of the themes you're both kind of talking about is that it's up to us uh, moving forward to, I think the Jewish expression is, you know, to pray with your feet, to, to, to embody w the values that we, that we have inherited, the greatest values. And then also this idea about, about uh, being part of a, 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 a plural community that we need one another as human beings. When I'm hearing this, I'm thinking about my old job, which was uh, in, as the VP of Education, overseeing the Noah's Ark exhibition. And that same theme that we're all part yeah. of this community, we need one another to stay afloat, is is never been more kind of poignant and important than now. So I want to just add, um, ask one more question of our of our of my colleagues, and then we're going to come and visit with you a little bit and g give you a chance to to talk with us and ask any questions you have one on one. Um, so the last question is really, um, is there, since this is sort of a fun chance with the, the members who are so close to us to get a behind the scenes look uh, into this process, is there anything about the process of creating these exhibitions that surprised you or charmed you or, um, you know, was made you full of dismay? Um, maybe we'll start with Vicki. Okay, um, I have, my answer is kind of simple, but um, I, I think sometimes having worked with a lot of contemporary artists, um, like in my background, it always strikes me that the most quote unquote like famous and like well established and well recognized artists are usually like the easiest artists to work with, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. And that always surprises me. Cause it's like basically like if you were saying like the biggest star in the world, you're, you get to work with them and there's a level of nervousness and like the sense of like, oh my gosh, like am I gonna, do a good job or like, you know, like just the caliber of person you're working with. And it always strikes me that they're usually the most gracious and generous and and wonderful to work with. Just really, um, yeah, they have like nothing to prove. They don't have a chip yeah. on their shoulders. So that's always just, I, I forget it every time and then I'm always pleasantly surprised. So that's what that's was lovely. That's interesting because you've worked with a whole range of artists. <laughs> and for those of you who weren't familiar with the name Yinka Shonabari, he is an internationally recognized artist. And mm -hmm. we're so fortunate and we're fortunate that he's such a generous spirit. Alyssa. Because most of the exhibitions that I've worked on in my past um, involve individuals and artists who are no longer living, it was a particularly wonderful experience for me to collaborate so closely with the family, the heirs of the Bloch family, and to feel like this was really a true collaboration in creating this exhibition, as well as with our curatorial assistants and designer and exhibitions coordinator, and but I didn't, I didn't realize that their family would become my family and how I would feel walking into this space and feeling like I'm telling the story not just of these people, but people who I know and love and have really been taken in by. And that actually translated into the design of the exhibition and Cheryl Bernstein welcomed me into her home for oh so many hours and gave me food and coffee and everything I needed as I poured over the documents in her home. And the objects that she and her mother and her grandmother had saved and their warm and welcoming spirit of inviting me into their lives and their story and their hearts is something I really wanted to translate into the exhibition. And it's the reason why when you go in, the central seating in the exhibition is a dining room table that looks like the dining room table in the photograph of the Bloch family dining room. And because in the way that they welcomed me in, we want our visitors to be welcomed into their home as well. And when you first walk into the gallery, you walk in through this mural of 
that's actually a photograph of the family home. And it is the formal living room into which, through which you would walk into the dining room. And so I wanted the gift that they gave me of that sort of intimacy and love and welcome, something that the Skirball does oh so well, to be felt by everyone who comes in. And so that was a surprise in the best way possible. Thank you. That's a beautiful note to end on. And I'm so, I'm just so grateful on behalf of the Skirball and just really personally for the work that you have each done on these exhibitions. Thank you. We couldn't have done it without you, Sherry. And I'm so Seriously. grateful to all of you. You know, we've been talking a lot about family and you are our extended Skirball family. And um, really, we want to thank you so much for being here today. And we'll be here for a bit just to to, to say hello to you and, and get to know you a little bit, um, for those of you who we don't know. So thank you for being here today. Thank you.